start this um, this session. Wonderful that you all uh, joined us for listening to my great dear colleague Stefan Grimm from New York, Fordham University. Over the years, we've met many times and friendly to one another, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, profession that you get to know so many who are really the same cast of mind as we have. Welcome. So, um, Stefan Grimm specializes in epistemology, philosophy of science, philosophy of religion, and ethics. Um, one interesting thing that he does, among many other things, is that he, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention two interesting things. He is the series editor for Oxford University Press for a series that's named Rides to the Good Life. So, um, the class I talked about this, uh, this, this book that appeared uh, already in the 80s, uh, Philosophy as a Way of Life. Uh, and, and the ancient philosophers, they connected philosophy to ways of living. And in a way, what sort of life should we live, you know, given that we philosophers and how these philosophers over the ages conceive of how they should live, given their philosophical convictions. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gaining time because we are waiting for some essential part before, uh, <laughs> that's why I'm lingering on. Uh, another interesting thing is that um, in the fall of this year, or over some time in the Bronx, these high school kids this summer. This summer. Okay. So for three weeks with the, with the kids from New York, and they were, they were selected, and they actually read Plato, Aristotle, uh, Epicure, Epicurus, the Stoics, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King, uh, with these kids from seven years old, and uh, I thought it was, it was marvelous. Yeah. Um, so. I don't think we're going to wait any longer for. I can start with that before. You can start with that before. So, uh, <laughs> thanks for being with us. And um, I'm really eager, as you're all here, to hear you talk about four levels of understanding. So, I should have said that we announced it as a fossil in the humanities, which is also a thing that he's is working on, along with Big Pillars and myself. So, we're, we're, we're authoring the book under the title of Fossil in the Humanities, uh, which is a fun project. Uh, but he's actually going to talk about something else, namely four levels of understanding. This Steve wrote an awful lot of good stuff on understanding. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Renee. And there might be some connections between uh, the kind of understanding I'm going to talk about here and understanding of the humanities that we could discuss. But thank you all very much for being here. I just got in from New York recently, and I just love being in Amsterdam. It's such a it's just one of the great cities in the world. So here's an overview of what uh, we're going to talk about today. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Excuse me. Yeah. Can, I have a, um, can the slides be downloaded somewhere? Or? Uh, sure. Top there, Ben Booker. That's all right. Um, oh, you mean right now? I mean, if right now, if not, also after. Sure. Okay, I, I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, you can do it. Okay, no problem. Good. So in the first part of this talk, I'm going to look at certain uh, debates, controversies in the philosophy of understanding. 
So in about the last 20 years, understanding has taken center stage in, in epistemology and the philosophy of science, thinking about it as a distinctive epistemic good. But already there are just um, controversies about how to think about the good of understanding. So I'm going to look at some debates, actually not just in the last 20 years, but in the history of science and history of recent epistemology, to look at some of these places where it looks like the debate is just stuck. Then, um, so since it looks like the debate is stuck and we need to find a way to move beyond this impasse, I'm going to look at a few different proposals for moving beyond the impasse um, and then make a case for my preferred kind of response, which is to say, in fact, people are not necessarily arguing about one and the same thing, that we can distinguish at least four different kinds of understanding. So it's not the case that people are fighting over the same thing, but they, you might say that they're they're a bit talking past one another. So after I make this case that there are a few different kinds of understanding, the task is to say, okay, so what unites these different kinds of understanding? Are they just a heterogeneous bunch? Or can we say something about what it is that unifies those kinds of understanding? And my claim is going to be that what unifies these four different kinds of understanding is the idea of modality. So modality has to do with possibility and necessity. And I think that these different levels of understanding correspond to our grasp of different kind of modal properties. So properties of possibility and necessity. And finally, um, in the philosophy of science, you, or just in the sciences, it sounds like people in this room are philosophers, but in the sciences, the appeals to mechanism, mechanisms in the sciences, the search for mechanisms in biology and chemistry and physics is pervasive. And the thing that's puzzled me for a while is what is kind of epistemic good that comes out of the search for mechanisms or the discovery of mechanisms in the sciences. And I want to tie this to the idea of, of uh, understanding that mechanisms uh, contribute to understanding in a distinctive way. So I mentioned I'd be beginning with uh, some disputes. So the disputes, um, I, I get these examples actually from someone who talked at the VU for 20 years, uh, Hank Direct, who is now at Nyman, I take it. But uh, Hank has been very influential in my thinking about this. And these are examples from his uh, 2017 book. So he, he looks at these eminent sciences um, uh, for some of their quotes about what produces understanding or fails to produce understanding. From, from Hank's book, uh, here are two quotes from Erwin Schrodinger, both of which are basically uh, pushing the idea that Anschaulichkeit, which I would interpret as something like seeability or visualizability in English, is a necessary condition on understanding. So Schrodinger says, we cannot really alter our manner of thinking in space and time, and what we cannot understand within it, we cannot understand at all. And later he says, uh, talking about uh, Heisenberg's, Heisenberg's matrix mechanics, I naturally knew about his theory, but was discouraged, if not repelled, by what appeared to me very difficult methods of transcendental algebra and by the want of Anschaulichkeit. So he's looking at Heisenberg's science and he thinks this is impressive in some ways, but it lacks visualizability, see, see ability. And without this Anschaulichkeit, it seems not to provide understanding at all. So Heisenberg replied, Heisenberg said in a letter to Pauli, the more I think of the physical part of Schrodinger's theory, the more abominable I find it. What Schrodinger writes about on Schalichkeit makes scarcely any sense. In other words, I think it is crap. So uh, Heisenberg is like, what's this? What's this demand for visualizability, seeability? That's not an essential part of science. It seems to be uh, almost a little, just a local concern of Schrodinger's. Here's a second dispute between uh, Lord Kelvin, a, a British scientist, and Pierre Duhem, a, a French scientist. So Lord Kelvin in England said, um, on the importance of physical modeling, I can never satisfy myself until I make a mechanical model of a thing. If I can make a mechanical model, I can understand it. 
If I cannot make a mechanical model, uh, otherwise I cannot. And I hope this is somewhat intuitive. Like if you can build something, if you can see the connections, he's saying you can understand it. If not, then not. And Pierre Duhan said in response, that just basically shows a weakness of the English mind, <laughs> that they need to have uh, machines and pictures. The French mind is a lot stronger. We don't need uh, machines connecting things. We can reason more abstractly, perfectly able to understand without pictures. So two different disputes. Again, Heisenberg and uh, Schrodinger saying visualizability is necessary. No, it's not. Um, Kelvin saying a mechanical model is necessary. Duhem saying, no, it's not necessary for understanding or not necessary. So as philosophers, we can look at this and say, so how do we, how do we adjudicate this dispute? At one level, we might just, we might fight it out. So if I'm a hero of the idea that uh, understanding requires visualizability, then I might look at, at examples in the history of science, I might think of thought experiments and try to demonstrate that visualizability is necessary for understanding. And you, if you don't believe that, you're gonna come up with your own thought experiments and try to dispute me. Another response which, uh, which uh, Professor Direct defended was to go contextualist. What Direct claimed was that uh, what's required for understanding is to be able to use intelligible theories. And uh, Schrodinger found visualizable things intelligible. Heisenberg didn't require visualizability for intelligibility. So what it require, what's involved for a theory to be intelligible for me or for you or for someone else could just vary a lot. And it's just a person to person, context to context matter. And that's basically all you can say about it. A third response is the response I'm gonna go for, and I'm gonna distinguish uh, different levels of understanding. So when Heisenberg was saying uh, visualizability is not necessary, and when Schrodinger was saying it is, I'm saying they're talking about different levels of understanding, different kinds of understanding. So, um, so I think uh, the levels option is better, but a question is, so how do I make this case? Why don't I go to the fight it out option? Why don't I go to the contextualist option? I think um, I'm not gonna say much about the contextualist option, but I will say that if we try to fight it out, uh, we're gonna get some, the, the cases which seem to show in favor of just maybe one uh, degree of understanding, they're just, it's just not satisfying. So when people try to fight it out, they leave something important out, I wanna say. So I'll try to make this case by looking at two different examples in recent philosophy. So I was talking about the history of science, now thinking about recent philosophy, uh, epistemology and philosophy of science. There are uh, two cases I wanna talk about to see, get your intuitions going about them. One is from Duncan Pritchard, who was a the University of Edinburgh for a long time. Now he's at um, uh, California Irvine. The other is from a philosopher at uh, MIT, uh, Bradford Scow. And, and both of them offer a way, of, they fight it out about the nature of understanding and come to a similar conclusion. And I think it leads them actually to a very bad place. Okay, so here's a case from Pritchard, uh, which it, it's gonna be on three slides since it's quite a bit of text. But just as a background to this, Pritchard asks us to imagine uh, a, a, a scientist, a chemist named Kate. Kate um, sees uh, oxygen being introduced into this chemical solution, sees a reaction take place, and supposedly understands why the reaction took place, namely because of the introduction of oxygen into the solution. But again, the background is supposed to be Kate is an expert chemist, she not only sees the introduction of oxygen, but can tell kind of a story about how the one leads to the other. And he contrasts this with another figure called Kate Starr. Um, so again, this is a fairly long example, but I'll get it out there. Consider first how an agent might have knowledge of causes while lacking the corresponding understanding. 
The point here is that there are ways in which my, one might gain knowledge of causes which wouldn't suffice for understanding. So, for example, consider a counterpart of Kate, Kate Starr. Kate Starr is not an expert chemist, basically. Kate Starr knows, comes to know that it was the introduction of the oxygen which caused the chemical reaction, not because she figured this out for herself, but because a fellow scientist, I guess, well, she's at least not, she lacks some important knowledge here. A fellow scientist who has specialized expertise in this regard, which our hero lacks, informs her that this is the cause of the reaction. Furthermore, let's stipulate that Kate Starr, while generally proficient in chemistry, does not have any sound epistemic grip on why the introduction of oxygen should have this effect on the substances in question. So Pritchard, came, Pritchard claims Kate Starr knows why the, re the chemical reaction took place, and she knows that it took place because of the introduction of oxygen. Crucially, however, Kate Starr does not understand why the chemical reaction took place, because in order to possess understanding in such a case, it is surely required that she should have a sound epistemic grip on why cause and effect are related in this way. Since Kate Starr lacks this, she lacks understanding. One can thus have the relevant knowledge of causes and yet lack understanding. So the mere idea, if someone were to tell you that this reaction took place because oxygen was introduced, we could do a poll in this room and say how many people think that understanding is produced as a result of that knowledge. Pritchard at least says no understanding. And it's similar to another case that he offers. So just to back up a bit, he doesn't just say that no understanding is produced. He offers an account of why there's no understanding. That what Kate Starr lacks is a sound epistemic grip on how the cause and effect are connected. So as it were, a, a leading thread going from the introduction of oxygen to the chemical reaction. And Pritchard makes a judgment like this in other cases too. For example, he imagines that his young son comes home and sees the house burning down, sees a house fire. Uh, like a fire marshal on the scene tells the young son that the house fire occurred because of faulty wiring. Pritchard's judgment is that his young son would then know why the house fire occurred, because there's faulty wiring, because there was faulty wire, but he wouldn't understand why the house fire occurred, because to have understanding requires a more sophisticated grasp of how the cause and effect are connected. So in that case, too, there's no understanding, according to Pritchard, because there's no uh, grasp of how the cause and effect are connected, why the cause should lead to the effect. And similarly, this philosopher from MIT, I'm just gonna say he introduces basically a very, same, a very similar case. He imagines a guy, uh, Lester, in a thought experiment, who while generally adept at chemistry, knows terms like acid and base and litmus paper, sees someone dip a bit of litmus paper in an acidic solution and the litmus paper turns red. And then the person tells him the litmus paper turned red because the solution was acidic. And Scow's claim is that the person now does not have an understanding of why the litmus paper turned red if all he knows based on testimony was that the litmus paper turned red because it was dipped in an acidic solution. It says for that more not for genuine understanding, more knowledge of the connection between the cause and effect are required. You have to know the facts in virtue of which the acid turns the paper red. So here's my kind of uh, take on this. I think what we should do as philosophers is grant that if you only know that the solution, that the litmus paper turned red because someone told you the solution was acidic, if you only know that a uh, reaction took place because someone introduced oxygen, that's not the highest level of understanding. That's, that's a very modest form of understanding. And I think we should grant that. But to say that there's no understanding there at all, I think leads to skeptical consequences very quickly. So what I think we should do is to say that, um, in fact, there are different levels of understanding here. So why does it lead to skepticism? I submit we could think of all sorts of cases where basically all you know is that there was some cause introduced that somehow brought about the effect 
and yet you take yourself to have understanding. So why is she having an allergic reaction? Because she's allergic to peanuts. There were some peanuts hidden in this dish. Why is he slurring his words? Because he's had several glasses of wine. Why did the pain start to fade in this part of the room? Because it was in direct sunlight for a number of years. Why did the TV just turn on? Because I touched the on button on the remote by accident. Why does her skin burn? Because she was out in the sun too long. I submit there are just countless cases of everyday understanding where we have zero knowledge of whatever it is that would connect the cause and the effect but still we take ourselves to understand the event to at least some extent. If really you know that your friend was allergic to peanuts and now has had a peanut and was uh, having an allergic reaction, and all you could point to was the introduction of the peanuts, still, I think, we basically know why our friend is having, we understand why they're having the reaction because of the peanut. Similarly, I have no idea how wine induces slurring of speech, but I take it we all would understand if someone's slurring their speech, it's because they have this wine. So my, my uh, takeaway from this is we have to allow, I think there's an understanding in cases like this, even when all we can do is basically identify a cause and even when we have little or no knowledge of the intervening mechanisms, which might connect the cause and the effect. To say that, no, you need knowledge of somehow how the cause and effect are connected would evaporate, I think, the, the vast, a large majority of the things we take ourselves to understand. But again, at the same time, I think we can understand the intuitive grasp of the judgment that if you really only know the solution, the reaction took place because of the introduction of oxygen, or you really only know that your friend is having an allergic reaction because she ate a peanut. You can't tell anything up that there's something else is lacking. So my solution is to again to think about to distinguish different levels of understanding. But how should we think about these different levels? Okay. There are a few different proposals on the scene. So I'm not the only one to suggest that there are different varieties of different levels of understanding. So Tanya Lombroso at Princeton, a, a, a psychologist actually, Tanya distinguishes between uh, mechanistic and functional understanding. She thinks there are these two kinds. Wesley Salmon, who was a famous philosopher of science at the University of Pittsburgh for a number of years, distinguished between causal mechanical understanding and unification-based understanding. So there have been other proposals in, in the last 50 years or so where people say, actually, there's not just one kind of understanding, there are different levels of understanding. I'm not gonna engage with this uh, too much. I'm just gonna say there are other proposals out there. They're interesting. One thing I will dispute is the idea that there's a distinction between some people who might wanna say there, there are two different kinds of understanding going on in the peanut case, in the slurring of the words because of the wine case. So some people, I think Henk Direct, who used to teach here, I think Kareem Khalifa, who's now at UCLA, he defends views like this, wants to say that, well, scientific understanding, to really have scientific understanding, you need a, not, you need a story about that causal connection. To just identify the cause is not enough. So you might make a distinction between scientific understanding, the beautiful things scientists have, which has, a story about the connection between cause and effect versus mere lay understanding, the kind of ordinary everyday understanding we have of people, you know, slurring their words because of drinking or getting allergic reaction because of peanuts. So I'm not a fan of this. And I'll just briefly say why. I just don't like this distinction. Here's, uh, so just spelling it out a bit, you might say, okay, lay understanding is when you can identify a causal factor like the wine or the peanuts or the oxygen. Scientific understanding is when you can grasp how the cause produces the effect or how the cause and effect are connected. I, I just, I think this is, I think this is a bad picture of science, basically. So here's an example from the history of science. Here's a, a uh, he wasn't a scientist, he was a, sorry, he wasn't a philosopher, he was a, He's a scientist 
He was a doctor, Ignaz Semmelweis in Vienna in the mid 19th century. And what uh, Semmelweis found happening, in, so in the hospital where he worked, in the maternity ward of the hospital, the level of maternal deaths at the hospital was unusually high. So um, something about this hospital, something about the division in the hospital, mothers were dying at an unusually high rate. So Semmelweis basically did a very careful uh, uh, study, uh, try to come up with hypotheses for why mothers in the ward were dying at an unusual high rate. So he tested you know, this theory about what they were eating, this theory about kind of the medicines they were being given. And then another theory that he tested, which actually turns out to be the truth, is that um, the doctors who were treating the mothers in the maternity ward in this hospital were typically coming from the autopsy room. So they would be working with corpses and then they would be going from the autopsy room to the maternity ward uh, and delivering the babies. And what he thought is that, uh, so he, he hypothesized about a cause. He called it cadaveric part, basically stuff from the corpses in the autopsy room that was having an impact on the maternal deaths on the higher rate. So the intervention that he proposed is that the doctors, well, that they thoroughly wash their hands in between going from the autopsy room to the maternity ward. And indeed it worked. The level of maternity de maternal deaths just dropped enormously until it was normal. So I, I could give you more details about this experiment, but basically it's the, the number of hypotheses that he considered, rejected, how he came upon the idea that it was something about the cadavers from the autopsy room that was uh, leading to the maternal deaths. If this, if this doesn't qualify as a beautiful bit of science, of scientific exploration, experiment, hypothesis, discovery, then that sets a very hard, high bar on what we're going to count as acceptable science. But I noticed that at least at this time, there was no knowledge of the germ theory or anything like that. No knowledge of something that would connect the cadaveric particles to the maternal deaths. So essentially he had done a beautiful job of identifying the cause without any sense of how the cause could be actually bring about the maternal deaths. So I would just say, this is clearly a beautiful case of scientific understanding. And you could have beautiful cases of scientific understanding where nothing like uh, that internal uh, mechanism is discovered. So this, this might just be a private annoyance on my part, but when I hear people distinguish between scientific understanding and lay understanding, and say that scientific understanding involves this, this graph of how the cause and effect are connected, I think there's a law in a very impressive science which just does it, it's a hard to figure out to identify the cause in the first place, even if you have no knowledge of intervening effect. But I think that some of us had some understanding then of why the mothers were, were dying with that reason. Okay, so this is the second part. The first part of the talk was basically to say, here's this dispute. Some people saying visualizability is needed. Some people saying it's not needed. Some people saying you need a mechanical model. Some people saying it's not. Um, here are some, there have been some attempts to solve this dispute by distinguishing between varieties of understanding, uh, maybe scientific and lay understanding. I, I just find those inadequate, so I'm going to try to introduce my own theory. Um, yeah, so you don't want to, I think, if you're fighting it out, yeah, you don't want to just say there's just one kind of understanding. Okay. So the kind of understanding, the levels of understanding I'm going to uh, uh, try to make a case for is that these levels are grounded in, in, in modality, in our, our apprehension of different degrees of modality. So modality, again, has to do with possibility and necessity. Uh, so some people, I'm not, again, just not the very first one, 
to think of this idea. There's a, a, a colleague of mine at um, uh, the University of Montana, Swazid Lebehem, who's developing a theory modality along this, these lines. But I draw inspiration really in a significant way from this guy, Robert Nozick, who taught at Harvard for a number of years. Nozick in a 1981 book said something I find very suggestive, that explanation locates something in actuality, showing its actual connections with other things, while understanding locates something in a network of possibility. So when you understand something, we could talk about how it relates to understanding people, like humanistic things, uh, showing the connections it would have to non-actual things or, or possible processes. It's a connection between understanding and possibility I find very pregnant, very, very important. Uh, so in many ways, I just want to elaborate this idea that understanding involves locating something in a network of possibilities. In different ways something might be, why it happens to be one way rather than another, and why perhaps it must be one way rather than another. And there are these different levels corresponding to different ways of apprehending mod uh, modality. And actually in one way, I'm trying to just flesh out an insight that I think Aristotle had in the fourth century BC, where Aristotle said, there's a highest level of modal apprehension where we understand something simpliciter or without qualification. Uh, and I think that for Aristotle, the highest level of understanding is where we grasp necessities that something has had to be the way it is, that there's no way it could otherwise be. Um, but so, I'm going to try to make a case for this, that this is the highest level, but it'll take us a little while to get there as I build it up. So I'm going to introduce these different levels and just a few caveats in advance. I don't think that we always, I'm going to say here's level one, here's level two, here's level three, here's level four. I don't think we always move in some like linear way like this. I think there's also gains in understanding within levels. Okay, but let me just start with uh, what I think is level one understanding. And we're trying to get a, a sense of, uh, of understanding a domain. And the, the basic intuition I want to start with is what our understanding of a domain improves as our knowledge of the elements of that domain improves as well. So I'm gonna put it some, sometimes as our knowledge of the furniture, like what's in that domain. This might sound like a minor point, but I actually think that our understanding of the world is built on it. So again, simple, but when we shoot up telescopes into space and when they give us these stunning pictures of the universe, it's very natural, it's almost unavoidable to say that our understanding of the universe increases as our, as our knowledge of just the furniture of the universe increases, of what there is and how it's distributed. And I want to say this is tied to like a question. So we have this question about what there is in a given domain. The more we learn about the furniture of that domain, just the elements of that domain, the better our understanding. And um, this isn't just the case of the universe. As we get fMRI scans of the brain, our understanding of the brain improves. Just, to, just really in a basic way, the more we learn about the constituent elements of the brain the furniture of the brain. If you think that your understanding of the brain before and after you see images like this, which map out the brain in a very detailed way, which you might've never known about before, is the same, I think that's very unusual. Most of us would say, before we even start talking about anything like causes or effects, our understanding of the brain increases just as we get a more accurate picture of the brain. And again, I think this is pervasive. Our understanding of the depths of the ocean improves the more we learn about the creatures and systems uh, that populate the depths. Your under if you were to go to New York, your understanding of the New York subway system would improve the more you learn about the different stations, the different lines, how they interact. But even before even talking about interaction, 
really just as, as you get a more complete map of the New York subway system, it's very natural to say your understanding improves. Like we could think of just so many cases, our understanding of the Amazon improves when we learn more about the vast array of living and non-living things there. Basically with respect to any domain, your understanding of it improves the more you learn about the furniture of that domain. I did this in my hotel room. <laughs> so I'm really crap at PowerPoint. Um, but I okay, just like think, you know, you know nothing about uh, this is like time is going by, you know nothing about some domain to begin with. You start to populate it. Actually, it looks like in in the in the, the Netherlands, is there a, a breakfast cereal called Lucky Charms? <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, it's a terrible. It's basically little sugar cubes in in uh, in cereal form. When I was a kid, it was my greatest dream to have Lucky Charms for breakfast. But my mom never <laughs> would let me. But it's these colorful little stars and uh, and squares and crescent moons and all these things. But so that's just. Basically, think of some domain, think of the different furniture in the domain, your knowledge of this domain, whether it's the Amazon, the, your brain, the ocean floor, whatever it is, your understanding of it is going to be improved the more you learn about the elements of that domain and how they're related. This might seem so basic as to not be worth mentioning, but actually, I think it's very much worth mentioning. Um, for one thing, I think. I don't think it's just a quirk, twer, uh, it's just a quirk of English that when we talk about telescopes going up into the universe and broadcasting beautiful pictures, that our understanding of the universe improves. There are other epistemic goods we could talk about. We could say our knowledge of the universe improves, but at least in English, it's almost irresistible to say our understanding of the universe improves. Similarly, when we do the fMRI scans of our brain, we could say that our knowledge of the brain improves, but at least in English, it's almost irresistible to say that our understanding of the brain improves. So I think it's important to say, as our understanding of domain gains, what's, what's, the, what's the basic level? And I think this is really the basic level. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just go down to this point. There's also, and so some people in uh, the literature on understanding say you only get understanding when you have when you have knowledge of an explanation uh, about why something is it is the case. And some people bring up counterexamples like, well, you can learn about the universe when you just learn more about the constituent elements of the universe. And that's supposed to be an objection to the idea that understanding always involves an explanation. And I just want to say with these theorists like Michael Stravens and Roy Young and Kareem Karifa, what they should say is, is really they should recognize different levels of understanding. And if you say that at a basic level, your understanding of the brain, of the universe, of something improves just as you learn more about the furniture, that's a genuine gain. And uh, there can be explanations at another level, but this is an important thing. So we have another, you know. 20 minutes, 30 minutes to go in this talk, not, well, but I'm just gonna gradually fill this in. So here's level one understanding, here's level two. Level one understanding, I'm just gonna say is mapping the furniture and it's a response to the question, curiosity we might have, what is there in this domain? What is the furniture like? Uh, just quickly before I go on to level two, you might think, so I've said this is a, an account of a modal account of, of understanding, and it looks like when we're just getting a sense of what there is in a domain, that's not an account of modality, possibility, and necessity. That's an account of actuality, like what there is. So two ways I might reply to that is one is to just to say, okay, maybe at the ground floor, modality is not operative. Maybe it just kicks in later, but I think even at the ground floor, when we're thinking about the universe, out of all the different ways the universe could be, which way is it? We're trying to think of all these different possible ways the universe might be. What's the actual way the universe is? Of all these different ways the brain might be, what's the actual way the brain is? So there's some sense of, as it were, logical or something metaphysical possibility. <clears throat> which part are we actually dealing with? 
So I do think that's a kind of finding your way through modal space as well. Okay, here's level two understanding. Um, if level one understanding again was, it, there's a question like, what is there in this domain? What's the furniture in this domain? Level one understanding comes from mapping the furniture in the domain. Level two, a quest, another question we could ask is, okay, you have these bits of furniture in the domain. What can these various bits do? And then I think we have understanding when we grasp uh, the powers and capacities of those things. So just in I mean, those lucky charms that the little map, so we have these bits of like the different elements of the domain. We've so far just kind of carved them off from each other, but what do those things do? That's another kind of question you could ask. And it might sound like uh, an, an kind of odd question to ask, but um, I used this slide last time. I, was, I just like this movie so much. So people seen uh, Arrival, the Amy Adams movie. It's a fantastic movie, right? So I find it helpful because, uh, uh, because when we're trying to, to think about understanding objects around us, understanding particular things, a lot of the objects, everything in this room, we're so familiar with, we kind of take it for granted. We can't get ourselves back into some naive state when we're thinking, okay, what does this do? But if you think of movies where something plummets down from outer space, and you, the, what people are wondering is really like, what is this thing? I think what they're basically asking, and among other things is, what can this thing do? Can it fly very fast? Does it have weird force fields? If you freeze it, will it, you know, if you, can it get cold? Can it get hot? Can it, does it have intelligence? What is it cap basically what can it do? So when this, these, Biscotti like shaped spaceships, when they come down in arrival, the first part of the movie, a large part of the movie is basically saying, so what is this thing? What powers and capacities does it have? What can it do? And I think this is another important kind of understanding. So of the things that we see, these elements in the world around us, what are its powers and capacities? What can it do? And I submit to you that our understanding of the world around us gains as we get a better sense of what these things can do. So if you were like Harry Potter and you walked in this room and just suppose Harry Potter is just not really a wizard, he's just crazy, he thinks he's a, maybe he thinks this, this uh, table could turn into a frog or do all sorts of things. He'd be mistaken. He would think these things could have powers that they don't really have, or a large part of our dealing with the world or found, finding out the, the actual powers and capacities which something really has. So this is a genuine kind of understanding that we can gain about the world around us. So a way to, again, you have to imagine yourself being very naive, almost fresh into the world. So the way I like to think about it is David Hume gives an example of um, he imagines a person called Adam, Adam, like a new human being, newly created. And he's looking at billiard balls, you know, just uh, strike one another and trying to imagine what's going to happen to the second billiard ball. Is it going to blow up? Is it going to turn invisible? Is it going to do something crazy? Start singing a tune, you know, Hume didn't talk about that. But our knowledge of the capacities of things is really, I think, deeply tied to our understanding of the world. So I think this is legitimately a second level of, of understanding. Um, let me just go back to the chart again. So the first chart level, mapping the furniture. The second, when you have these different levels, have these different items pick out, what can these various bits do? What are their powers and capacities? I think that's a very important and distinct kind of understanding. In, in reality, these things often go together. Like you really have to imagine some unusual cases where first you can identify a thing and you're puzzled, like what can this thing do? You have to imagine alien objects coming down from outer space. You have to imagine being Adam newly created in the world. Most of the time when we, if I were to go into a room in this building that I've never been to and I see 
literally like what the tables and chairs are like, what's in that room. I'm not really distinguishing, well, here's this object. Okay, what, is, what can the object do? Really, they go together in most of our everyday dealings with the world, but you can imagine them coming apart. And I think it's really helpful to imagine them coming apart. Okay, here's the third level. So we're almost at level four. The first kind of question is what's in this domain? What can these things do? I think this, the third level of curiosity, which corresponds to a third level of understanding is a grasp of the difference makers. So you saw with the Amy Adams case, with the, with the alien spaceship case, you try to get a sense of what are the different powers of this thing? What can it do? And I think there's a third level of curiosity why some of these possibilities rather than others? What is it that makes for the difference? So in crude picture form, it would be something like, there are these various powers and capacities and objects has various um, properties and might manifest various uh, ways that it might uh, unfold. If it's a bigger system. And then we're wondering, Okay, why one of these power, why one of these properties, or why one of these ways of unfolding rather than another? And I think what we want to identify here is, okay, what is it that made the difference on this end that led to the manifestation of one of these properties rather than another? I think that's a basic way in which we understand the world. So here's an example of uh, chopping onions. Let me just, um, I'll just spell it. So suppose I walk into the, kitchen in my house and I see my 18 year old son chopping onions and I see that his uh, eyes are watering as he's chopping. Seems like one question I might have is why are his eyes watering? In fact, it's not really a question because so many of us can identify the cause right like that. But I just wanna say that this is an important kind of understanding that to use it in schematic form, forget about this for a second. So you could represent these different features of the world with variables that can take on different values. So think of this as my son's uh, eyes. They have this power, they can be watering or they can be not watering. So we might think of, of the different ways things could be, the different, as it were, properties that might manifest. What is it that makes the difference between the watering and the not watering? And again, most of us just do this instantaneously, but imagine you're just an alien come down from outer space and you're really trying to figure it out. And I think, well, there are a number of different variables that were on the scene. Was it the time of day that made a difference? Was it the fact that he was cutting the onions at 323 rather than 325? Was it the chopping of the onions? Was it the music in the background? The fact that one song was playing rather than another? Was it the weather outside, the fact that it was cloudy rather than rainy, that's what's responsible for his eyes watering. And again, most of us just do this automatically. We would say, no, among all these variables that are somehow on the scene, it was the chopping of the onions that made a difference, made the difference in that case. In that case. And this is just a simple toyish example, but I think a huge part of our understanding is basically saying from among the various ways this thing, this system might be, what is it that makes the difference between one way rather than another? It could be the human body and some you know, illness we might have or disease that we might have. What is it that makes the difference? And here I'm just imagining one thing makes the difference. It could get more complex, but I think simplify, it's helpful to have this. So I'll just, so some might say, this isn't real understanding. You don't really understand why your son's eyes were watering when you just identified the chopping of the onions. But most of us, I think, would automatically grant that as a case of understanding. That we understand if you see someone in your house who's crying and you see them chopping onions, it's not a mystery to you in some sense what it is that's responsible for the crying. So if we say that a case like this is not understanding, I, I think, again, we evaporate, we become massive skeptics about understanding, say that there's very little understanding um, 
in our world. Much of what we take to understand, we don't. Um, and so this bit, so why is it understanding? I think what one thing understanding involves is giving you a genuine, some genuine handles in the world. Like why is this person's eyes watering rather than not watering? What variable can I manipulate to bring about the watering versus not watering? When you identify the chopping of the onions, I think that gives you a handle on the world that actually constitutes that understanding. And it's incredibly valuable um, when you could potentially control the way the world unfolds in this way. Um, and I, an empirical hypothesis, I mentioned there's this psychologist at Princeton who's doing some work on this. I think she's testing out the hypothesis that, or interested in the hypothesis that most people, their curiosity and desire for understanding is basically satisfied at this level, what I'm calling level three. When you wonder why this rather than that, and you can identify uh, a factor that, a variable that influences that, your, your understanding is satisfied. But of course, there are other levels that we could have, other levels of curiosity. You might just, you might not just be curious about, about why the crying, but you might wonder, what is it about the onion that brings about the watering? What is the onions, as it were, active ingredient? What are the intermediate steps uh, that it connect the ingredient to the watering? So the hypothesis would be, where are, where are most people satisfied? Probably they're satisfied just when they have, as it were, some cause that controls the effect. But clearly many people, maybe many of us, often want to know more. Maybe especially scientists want to know more. Okay, so I'm gonna call this a desire for mechanism or maybe a curiosity about mechanism. And I'm, one thing I'm wondering is, does this give us a whole new level of curiosity when we're wondering about the mechanism, curiosity level four, which I'll describe in a moment? Or is it, uh, is it a new kind of understanding? So one answer is just no, in the following sense. Let's say I learn more about the onion and I learn that when the onion is chopped, a chemical is released, it travels through the air, that chemical uh, you know, gets to people's retinas, it irritates their retinas, that introduces a tear response and uh, someone cries. I'm really curious about this mechanism because one thing that the mechanism might do is just give us more handles on the world, more weird places in which we could intervene. So let's say we think that when the onion is chopped, a chemical is released that goes towards the eye and irritates it. You might think that when you see this kind of chem, when you visualize this chemical going through the air, you can imagine it's a different handle on which you could potentially bring about the crying or not. Maybe you could intervene in that case. And maybe if you think that there's still another step where it irritates the retina, maybe you could think, well, and maybe I could kind of shield the eye in some way so the chemical doesn't impact the retina. If that's the case, this might sound a bit weird, but I'm still thinking it's at the level, it could be at level three, where we're just looking the desire for mechanism, the desire to find more handles on the world, more ways in which we can manipulate the outcome. But one thing I would find plausible is that that's not a difference in degree in kind and understanding, it's just a difference in degree. That there are more handles here, uh, but they're still just handles. Can I also say Yeah, sure. Um, I think you uh, made a jump and not t told us how to choose between the four possibilities of causes of the crying of the sun. For all the four uh, possibilities were possible uh, and you have to choose between one of these. And I think the, the, uh, the, the first level to say, I'm going to search for the for the cause mm -hmm. for the, the so the first scientific 
uh, in interest here is to choose between um, those four possibilities, and you didn't say that. Oh, sorry. Um, so I actually think that, that yeah, no, so I, I think that uh, in all these cases, so love, so our understanding, I think, grows, gets better, so we're, the more of these levels yeah, we have. I mean, uh, if, if you have heard that by chopping the onions, you can fry, then you have four possible uh, causes, and then you have to choose, so yeah. The, the shine, the shining can can uh, retrieve. And she and and she can can retrieve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, I think all at least three levels will be involved there. But I'll I'll mention the fourth in a second, and you can tell me whether you find it. Uh, I actually think that the fourth is probably not involved here. But when I have the full chart, I'll explain the onion example in terms of that. And then I hope that will help. So uh, on one level of thinking about that mechanism of the chemical that's released and so on, it's just a way to find more handles, more difference makers. Uh, another level is that when we understand it, when we see the mechanism, we don't just grasp difference makers, we grasp uh, necessitators and I'll just briefly <laughs> say about that. So I think there's a highest level of understanding when we don't just figure out why something rather than another happened, why the eyeballs watered rather than not because of the chopping, but when we see that the outcome had to happen. So if you find the mechanisms in a watch, say in a pocket watch, and you're wondering why the hour hand is moving at a certain rate, and you can literally see the mechanism of the gears and the teeth and the gears turning each other and forcing one gear, forcing the movement of another and still another gear, forcing a movement of another. And then that forcing movement of the hand, that's a very powerful kind of mechanism. And I think what that gives you, one reason why we often seek it is because that showed us why the result had to occur. And I just want to say, this idea that we only have understanding when we, when we figure out why something had to occur, you see, you can see philosophers say it. In fact, I wish I had time. There are a bunch of classical uh, German philosophers where it seems like the desire is, uh, of understanding is desire to figure out why something had to be the case, why it could not be otherwise. And when we fall short of that, we really fall short of understanding. But that just doesn't happen in classical German philosophy. I think that you see other ideas about this. So Clark Gleamore says, one way in which our wonderment about a phenomenon can be relieved is the demonstration that it's necessary, that it could not be otherwise. One way, perhaps the most complete way to explain the ideal gas law is to show that it's not just, just not possible for a gas to have pressure, volume, and temperature other than the gas law requires. So, you see why pressure had to be a certain way when you grasp how it follows from the gas law. This philosopher at MIT says, a key, a key feature of these two examples is they show that the target event had to happen, that the non-occurrence was impossible. The fact that the explanations show this has a lot to do with their ex being explanations. And here's Aristotle, but now here's the quote. This is, I think, the highest level. He says in the posterior analytics, we think we understand something without qualification, not in a sophistical way. When we, when we know of the explanation of which the object holds, that is the explanation, and also that it's not possible for it to be otherwise. So here's Lord Kelvin again. So what I think is happening with Lord Kelvin's desire for mechanism is, again, when you really get a mechanism that literally you can see how it connects almost in like a, uh, like a row, like a bridge, bridges from one to the other. You could see how changing the value of the one physically necessitates changing the value of another. That's a very high degree of understanding tied to the idea of physical necessity. And I think when Aristotle talks about the idea of deduction or derivation, that's a very high degree of understanding tied to the idea of something like 
logical necessity. So now here's the complete map. So this is as our modal grip of the world improves, I think our understanding of the world improves, but I think there's understanding at every level. So first we ask the question, what is there in this domain? And we get some understanding when we start to map the furniture in that domain. Our understanding improves the more of it that we map. Next, we ask, what can these various items of the domain do? What are they capable of? And we get more understanding when we figure out the powers and capacities of these things. Another level of curiosity we have is, okay, from among the possibilities that things could manifest, or maybe the whole system, why some of these possibilities rather than another? And the fourth and the highest level of understanding, corresponding to the highest level of curiosity, is why do these things have to happen? What necessitated it or brought it about? And if we can grasp that, then not just that it happened because of this, but that it had to happen because of this, we have the highest level of understanding. So a few quick glosses. Sometimes we do not achieve that highest level of understanding, often. So in the onion case, I think, you, you just automatically, we know what onions are and we know what eyeballs are. We kind of take those things for granted. They're not dropping down from outer space. We know what those things are. We know that eyeballs are capable of watering because we've seen it. We, we could figure out that onions are capable of inducing a tear response. The third level, okay, from among these different possibilities, the tearing or the not tearing, what is it that makes the difference? And then we can identify perhaps the cutting of the onions or as the thing that makes the difference. And this could, we could gain an understanding as we get a better grasp of different makers, as we learn more about the chemicals that are released and the way it irritates the retina. I just, my hunch is that very rarely does that kind of explanation actually reach to the level of level four. Even if you had a science textbook, even if I were to draw for you, here's the cutting of the, if I were to do a YouTube video, here's the cutting of the onions, here is a chemical being released, here is it irritating the eye, here is it inducing a tear response. Just a lot of, I think, interesting cognitive work would have to go in for, to, for you to appreciate, not just that one thing followed another, but that the one thing necessitated the next thing, that this thing necessitated that thing, that this thing necessitated that thing. I think we're usually lacking that. We usually just have a sense that one thing falls in it. So in the case of the onions, I think we're somewhere at level three of which it could grow. Uh, and this is the second to last new slide. I see I'm over time, sorry, Vinay. But uh, I mentioned, I told you I'd talk about the strawberry. Here's an example of uh, that's been discussed in the literature now. Uh, so here's the question. Uh, why does mother, why does mom fail every time uh, she tries to distribute exactly 23 strawberries among her children uh, without cutting any? If you can understand the explanation for why you can't distri distribute uh, 23 strawberries equally among your three children without cutting any, basically you just, you see the math, you see that three can't go evenly into 20, you see that it's, it's impossible for the mother to evenly divide the strawberry. So that's a very high level, we take it almost for granted, but that's a level of grasping necessity, impossibility, this things could not possibly be that way. Uh, and that's a very high level of moral grasp. We take it for granted, but it's significant. Um, that's the last slide. Let me just, yeah. So you might worry that uh, the categories aren't cleanly distinct, like level one and level two understanding. As I said, you have to imagine some weird scenarios like Adam being newly born in the world, like spaceships coming down from outer space to separate in your mind, identifying a thing from identifying the powers and capacities of that. Usually as we walk through the world and we identify things, walls and doors, we identify the powers and capacities of that thing. Uh, 
level three and level four understanding, you might worry that they're not cleanly distinct because the more we get these, as it were, mechanisms, you might think that the more you know about mechanisms, ultimately that leads to necessity. But again, I'd like to hear more about that story. So maybe level three and level four are clearly distinct. And I'll just uh, skip the rest because I know we've gone on too long. So that's it. Thanks, uh, Steve, for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, there's now a Q&A uh, session. I see a couple of hands. Um, let's start. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, for example, in the, in the Onion case, um, you need level three uh, understanding to grasp the difference makers, but how can you be sure that this was the determining factor? Because I can also imagine that I don't know, not the audience, but the background music reminded that guy of something that's very sad and that made the cry. So yeah. this could also be only probabilities, right? Yeah, good. So you could be you could be mistaken about the difference maker. So in a given case, if it was the song that was on that was making him cry. And there, there are complicated cases where there could be a few causes like overdetermining things. If it was really the music making him cry and you thought it was the cutting of the onions then you would be mistaken. You would think you understood, understand, but you don't really understand. So our understanding is not transparent in the sense that if we think we understand, then we do understand. Many of the times we think we understand, I think we don't, or we might not. But one, one helpful way maybe to imagine it is that suppose you're not thinking about yourself, but suppose you are uh, judging someone else. So or someone else is making this judgment. Like he thinks that, uh, this guy thinks that the eyes are watering because of the onions, but really it's because of the song. Then we would think that guy's mistaken. The guy who thinks it's because of the song is, is uh, correct. So we can be mistaken in our judgments of understanding. But then also having this that's level. So let's start. Let's, 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 I don't want to cut it off. Uh, yeah. yeah, there are many hands. Um, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Grimm. It was a very interesting talk. And I have, I think, at least three questions, but I'll ask just one. <laughs> Number two. <laughs> so I, I thought the talk about the, the, the different levels extremely interesting, so there must be something to it. Um, but perhaps very obvious for you, this question. What about quantum mechanics, about level four? So you say that we arrive at this fourth level when mm -hmm. we say that things are necessitated, yeah. but clearly quantum mechanics shows that there are no necessary outcomes. Right. Yeah, good question. So there's a, there's a paper from the, the mid nineties, which, which the title, I don't know, are you, maybe you've seen it. It's called quantum mechanics end game for understanding. And basically what, the person argues is something like, it looks like understanding requires this high degree, almost like necessitation. And unfortunately in quantum mechanics, we don't have this necessitation. So is this an end game for understanding? Does it mean that we can't understand? And I would want to interject in that argument is that, listen, there are these levels of understanding. And if we can't get the highest kind of necessitation, it doesn't mean that there's not very valuable forms of understanding along the way. So in non-deterministic systems, say, when there's not necessitating, it, it, let's put it like this. Uh, if we were to only go up to level three and to get our handle on a bunch of different makers, I would not want to say that's failed understanding. Uh, you know, okay. you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, that would be Yes, thank you so much for the talk. So just a okay, question first. So you mean to be talking about causal understanding only or people's So I'm trying to be why open-minded about understanding. So I think a lot of the um, understanding we have in the world, the understanding we have in this room around us, just all the little things about what caused this sound. I heard a sound, what caused it? I heard I think that's basically you have 
something, you're trying to understand why did this happen, and you try to find a difference maker. But I, I guess one thing I would say is I'm open to the idea of there being non-causal difference makers, other things yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So then I have. <laughs> yeah. I, I have multiple questions, but so the first one is I was thinking about this first level that mapping the furniture is already maybe, um, you know, leaving our attention to how things, uh, to certain things and not to other things, and mm. especially to how things appear to us and not to the conditions that mm. make it possible that they appear to us this yeah. way, or yeah. questions like how, um, you know, why do we describe a fence in a certain way? Why yeah. do, we, do we think that certain descriptions apply not others yeah, yeah yeah why do we delimit certain objects in a certain way or sets of objects in a certain way yeah um so this would be then yeah well these kind of questions would lead to a different kind of understanding maybe than this the levels that you that that's set up here that's a nice point um yeah maybe there is uh a kind of uh implicit realism in, in level one, as I'm thinking about it, that there are real uh, joints in nature, as they say, which we, which our mind can grasp or not grasp. Uh, and maybe level one, I'm, I'm maybe taking that too much for granted. I'm gonna have to think about that more. But one thing I would say is that we have distinct things when we have things that have, you know, distinct powers and potential potentiality. So, if, if the thing was like, uh, you know, if I'm thinking of a thing, just like this little box and that table, and that's a possible way of carving up the world. If we want to think that the way we carve up the world is totally arbitrary or depends on person to person and culture, culture to culture. But this thing, this weird thing, does not, I think, have any distinct powers or capacities. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm not even sure, like, this, since this is not a, not, not a natural kind, has any distinct powers and capacities. So I guess my test would be, okay, when do you have a thing, like a lucky charm, is when do you have a thing with distinct powers and capacities? And that might be a hard test, but, but is your thought that even with that test, there's going to be some judgment about where the joints are, where the corners are? Yeah. 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 That might be that might be true. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's give someone else the floor, and then we can go back either back to you or or there are others on the line. Uh, Chris. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that, that was a really great um, presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask. Uh, well, also, I think maybe clarify. Um, so at level one, it's like this ontological level, and I was just wondering whether. It it's just like sort of the curiosity is about finding finding out what there what there is, or is it also finding out um, what do those things consist in? So imagine I'm not only just interested in whether there are any numbers, but I'm also interested in what is it to be a number. Mm. Do those both go at level one? Mm. Interesting. That was so just what a it is to be that thing. thing. <laughs> yeah. So what it is to be that thing? Yeah. Basically, because I couldn't. Fit yeah. that exactly in any of the other. So I would. Uh, good questions. You, Chris Finale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think um, I would equate that more with level two. So what it is to be. Uh, so you might say what it is to be fire. What it is to be water. I think. Well, you want to talk. You essential to that. I, well. There are going to be the various uh, powers of fire that it can burn, water that it could quench thirst, and so on. But is your question like, okay, we don't just find out, want to find out about what these things can do. We want to find out about their micro properties that allow like burning or quenching. Yeah, I mean, I picked a number example on purpose because, you know, then I wouldn't be looking for microstructure in this causal sense, but in this more. I don't know, looking for maybe in a compositional sense, like what are what 
what, yeah. what sort of elements to, or I, yeah, I guess maybe it does reduce to this property question, like which, which properties, what, yeah, maybe it does come down to like, what are the difference makers then, but it's about constitution rather than about coming to be. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Um, so, so um, Jaguan Kim talks about um, muriological dependence. So he talks about causal dependence, like why, you know, this causal property, but he talks about why muriological dependence, meaning why, how the properties of the whole uh, depend on the properties of the, the parts. So or how to manifest things depend on the micro. And I wasn't emphasizing that, but I feel like I could run that story again. So think about, like, let's say we're thinking about some item, maybe water or fire. And I want to think, okay, let's break down water and fire into its myriad, into its parts. And then I think, or, or maybe properties, I'm not sure how I want to think about it. And then I think, how do the properties of the whole depend on the properties of the parts? And then I might think, okay, I've taken the mapping question just on a micro scale. And then I think, okay, maybe it has these manifest, maybe it could, man maybe it can't manifest things in a variety of ways because it becomes essential. But I might be able to do this and almost the universe becomes that micro thing. And I realize why some properties of the whole are manifested rather than others. And I attribute that to the constituent parts being one way around another. But I'd have to think about that more because I feel like it would, might run up against like essential natures of things. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for that. Oh, okay. Um, thanks. Um, I also wanted to put pressure on the sort of individuating and ontological unit thing. Yes. Um, I think that was the causal thing, there's a neurological thing over there. I wanted mm -hmm. to put pressure on it from the idea of um, so perception and how um, it's difficult for us to isolate ontological unit without getting a sense of what it can do. So like our anticipations and our memories about the thing. Yeah. But I, I don't think we need to go. I think you also mentioned that the categories aren't that clean, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm kind of curious about how close you are. I don't know if that was in the last slide also, but how close you are to your Aristotelian inspiration, um, whether you think all these aspects are necessary for us to have a natural grasp of the, the object itself, right? Because Aristotle needed all four. Um, and in case of something like money, sometimes you can't have, say, a level one understanding. Like mm. getting a sense of getting more money doesn't mean I understand what money is. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to your first point, yeah, I do think that it's artificial in some way to prize apart level one and level two. I think usually we take them in together. Uh, uh, on the Aristotelian point, I think that I'd have to go back and look at the passages from the posterior analytics, but it's pretty clear, you'd say, this is understanding without, you know, simplicity or without qualification when we grasp these necessities. But I do, again, I have to go back to the text, but I do feel like there's understanding in a way or understanding so-called when we would just grasp, like, uh, you know, the difference makers. So he doesn't talk about this, but what, if you could understand why the tides are high rather than low because of you know the, the proximity of the moon. That would be one level of understanding, but until you could come up with some beautiful deduction, you don't have understanding simpliciter. But I think so. I would not regard that as I would regard that as like, oh, too bad. <laughs> you can't get the best, but this is still pretty great. And if Maybe it's the epistemologist in me thinking that uh, as epistemic accomplishments go, it gets, you know, good, better, better, this is very good and then best. So I wouldn't want to dismiss this as being like bad, it's still very good. Sorry, but the money question, I'm not sure I quite got that. Yeah, so I mean, in the case of money, it just doesn't seem that like we can have understanding level one of money, right? The more money we have, that doesn't mean that we, the more we map up the furniture of money, doesn't mean mm. we understand money. So if yeah. I have a million dollars, that doesn't mean I understand money more than I have a million, oh, a shot of a million by one. Yeah, that's a good, so understanding money. In a way, yeah, it doesn't seem to hit level one so much. 
you might go to level two, like understanding what money can do and the powers it has. So maybe it's and protecting the ontological unit of money as its power rather than yeah, okay. interesting, interesting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I move from the ontological questions because it's the reason why me and part of my cluster here are more because of the philosophy of science mm -hmm. and we had a chance to read what you wrote about the difference between understanding in the social and the natural sciences okay. so i wanted to kind of pressure you on that mm -hmm. um on that about this though um i think the question about the um, quantum mechanics kind of relates yeah as in that led you to talk about determinism and under determinism and i think if you see this aristotelic level for understanding in the social sciences you're kind of asking for a very deterministic understanding of human behavior mm -hmm. which you kind of argue against yeah. in, in your paper about that yeah. um and, and maybe this doesn't with money as well because maybe the problem with money can be in the fact that it's more something a product of human behavior rather than yeah interesting so so in the social sciences it could be when we're talking about understanding people and cultures and that kind of thing, right? Uh, it could be that level four is just not possible because maybe there's nothing in virtue of which it had to happen. Maybe if you have a strong theory of freedom, you're not gonna get necessitation. Um, uh, but I'll just say again, there's all sorts of good things before that so it's not like if if uh if we don't get to four then it's a failure and in fact you talk about philosophy of science i presented this paper recently to uh, a room mainly with philosophers of science and they really disliked level four <laughs> they said there's uh most of the many of the projects in the sciences we're just back up Scientists often have very local questions that they're trying to answer. You know, why did this happen? What's the mechanism? So, or maybe even, basically they have all sorts of questions and they might uh, find uh, legitimate answers to their questions and then be entirely satisfied that their question is answered and have a degree of understanding. And it would be weird to say, ah, but you can, too bad. <laughs> you know, you really didn't get this high. When they had a legitimate question, they answered it. So, in a way, it's uh, when I put level four here, it's not like I'm claiming that uh, A, this is always possible, B, that every scientific inquiry is geared towards this, C, that it sucks if it doesn't get to level four. I mean, there's all sorts of goodness that can be had there. Does that seem possible? I think the key is the fact that you said you don't claim that it always exists. Yeah. Like it's not a physical claim that you can always get to that level of certainty about things. No, sometimes there is no necessity. And really, I want to learn more about, I, I'm just going to throw out some names, you know, German philosophers who might, like Hegel, maybe Spinoza, who think that there is a kind of ultimate necessity that you might see. I'm speaking with a lot of ignorance here. But I, if that's the picture that there's this ultimate necessity either geist unfolding itself or something uh, then the the highest epistemic accomplishment you would have the highest level of understanding would be to see grasp the necessity and all the things we do until then are just on the path towards grasping the necessity if you don't think that necessity is there to be had then that's just a, a wrong project if you do think it's there, then it's a fascinating project. So um, I'm going to give you the floor, but first I have another thing. There might be people who are uh, zooming in. Mm -hmm. They might have a question as well. So um, yeah. can you see whether or not that's the case? Yes. yes. Um, thank you for the talk. And I was wondering when you were mentioning Aristotle, um, the highest level model of brandishing being where on grasp the necessities without qualifications. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of motions. So for example, as humans, we have our own frame of reference, mm -hmm. we interpret ourselves in a certain manner, and therefore we could perhaps say that our emotions are necessitated mm -hmm. by some kinds of mm -hmm. whole processes that we add. Would you perhaps argue in that way that this could invite moral, not moral, but like 
some kind of relativism, saying that, okay, I have this understanding, but somebody has another understanding for their own. So an action emotion path. Yeah, so interesting. So the thought would be, um, I, I feel like this emotion, uh, or maybe this experience necessitated this emotion in me. In your own frame of reference, yeah. Yeah. Um, that gets tricky because I could, I mean, it gets difficult about whether you have a kind of authority about interpreting your experience and whether you can be mistaken about interpreting your experience. There's a, I know some pressure to think that we have authority about interpreting our experience, but it's, it, there's also pressure against it. You know, our friends might be able to see that there was more contingency in your response than you saw. A therapist might see that there was more contingency in the response than you saw. So even if we think that it was necessary, there might not be this. So I don't know, but it, I don't know if that helps. If, if there is necessity there to be grasped, then I think that would be the highest form of understanding. If, it's, if there's more contingency, if there's more room for freedom, then if we, there might not be necessity there to be grasped. Um, I have a question because also you won a paper about understanding as a uh, grasping structure and understanding as um, like a being good. Um, yeah. So I thought, where does this level, like, I don't know if it's level, but I don't think like understanding as to be good is in these four levels, is it? Yeah. Is that what I was talking about? What it takes to understand other people? Yeah. So. Um, so I do think something very different is going on when we understand other people. And one thing that's involved in, in understanding other people, we, we could, as it were, look at other people as if they were systems or structures, like I could look at you, you could look at me, my psychology or psychology, and I could view it as a system that's the different parts that are influencing each other. But then there's another way in which I might take up your perspective or you might try to take up mine and then you see things not just as causes but as goods and desirable and not desirable. And I do think that that's hard to fit into this framework. So if I was giving maybe a more precise title for this talk, it would be four levels of understanding the natural world, something like that. And people, I think, are very interestingly different. So uh, some of this might correspond, but I do think that some of this might correspond. Were there any questions online? I don't see any questions in the chats yet. Let's do another check. I, I, I saw Peter with his hand, and that will be the final question because we have to. Uh, when, when starting the remark, I thought Salmon was talking about explanation, not so much about understanding, causal mm -hmm. mechanistic and, and unification of it. This. But my main question is, I mean, at one point you said, yeah, at least in English, we, we talk that way. That's a little bit funny, of course, to put it that way. <laughs> that in English you might uh, use understanding much more often than knowledge. I don't know whether it's true. But that's my main question is, uh, what is your systematic relationship between understanding and knowledge? Uh, you, didn't, you didn't even use the term knowledge very much. Sometimes you say something about the verb to know, to know more and so on. Right. And you can start with uh, level one. I mean, I, there's a class here on the table and I know that this is here. So I, no, it, no understanding is involved here. Right. And the last comment about your levels, I think they're just understanding of different things, different aspects, different objects, mm -hmm. not so much levels where you get higher and get some funny question on top here. There's no necessity, we can't have understanding of necessity 
It seems to be a triviality. No. Okay, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, I have a, a, a longer story about where understanding fits with knowledge. In fact, I do. I think understanding is a kind of knowledge. So uh -huh. there are different kinds of knowledge. I think corresponding to different objects of knowledge, like some. There's a priori knowledge, there might be moral knowledge. So I think it's a kind of knowledge. Uh, Am I like what was it? Actual knowledge or it's sorry. a kind of knowledge? What is it then specifically? What kind yeah, of kind, I think it's, kind of knowledge is it? So I think kinds of knowledge are uh, distinguished by the objects of knowledge, distinct object. And I think the distinct object of knowledge here is modal things, basically. So when we have this, this more or less impressive grasp of modality, that's in fact where um, understanding comes in. So when, yeah, that's what I think. In terms of the cup, um, so the knowledge that there's a cup, I don't think you'd have to be, you'd have to phrase it in the right way to, to make that seem like there's any understanding gain there. I think the way to think about that would be, so suppose there's a room next door that we don't know what's in it. And we say, uh, so, and when we walk in it, our understanding of the, the room improves. How does our understanding of the room improve or even take shape? Well, we see there are a few tables, there are a few cups, there are a few chairs. So you have to think about the domain in which the understanding is improved with the furniture. And the domain there would be like the room. Yeah, like knowledge, and I know that then more I know there's also a cup in there. So. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So yeah. thanks. Uh, yeah. yeah. We announced that we would end at five o'clock. We yeah, started so, a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, so we continued a, a little bit longer. So thanks, Steve, for uh, this wonderful talk, for uh, your uh, engaging QA. <laughs>